And so remember in that equation we had effective stress, so the pore pressure matters, and we can affect the pore pressure through injection. Right? We've known this for a long time, and it's certainly made the news a lot recently. Uh, with, reduce, with respect to induced seismicity, okay, from water injection related to hydraulic fracturing. And we'll talk a little bit more about induced seismicity later in the class, but just uh, as a point that, you know, while we hear much about it now, uh, this was known even back uh, in the 60s, they were injecting fluid into the Rocky Mountain arsenal. And so what you see here is a plot, and the axis on the left, uh, the axis on the left is associated with the dotted line. So this is the pressure. So the dotted line is the downhole pressure of injection versus time. And so you're talking about over a time of several years of constant injection. And so the downhole pressure uh, due to injection, and then the, the right-hand axis that's associated with the black lines are the number of earthquakes. Okay, and so you can see there appears to be a clear correlation with fluid injection and a number of earthquakes. And again, we'll talk more about induced seismicity later. So we can use we can use what we know about uh, faults. Excuse me, one second. I figure I think I'm missing you. I feel like I'm missing a slide. Maybe not. Okay. So <clears throat> we can use what we know about frictional failure of rocks and then slippage on faults to make put some bounds on the in situ stresses in the earth. And the reason for this is that we basically the entire surface crustal surface of the earth is under a constant state of incipient shear, shear failure due to faulting, okay? And the sort of mechanism for this, I mean, this is a cartoonish pic picture, but the sort of me mechanism for this is that, you know, the plate tectonics is a very slow process, right? It's, it's very slow, so the strain rates are slow. So if you take a, a large enough sample of the earth, we can basically say it's an equilibrium, right? Uh, you know, if we look at a large enough piece of the Earth, it's not really moving around that much, right? So it's roughly an equilibrium. And so we have a constant forces due to plate motion, right, driving forces, and this is associated with, like we talked about in the first day of class, you know, basically volcanic activity that's continually creating new, generating new earth and then subsidence, right? And this causes friction in the far field, which causes forces on the earth, okay? And th those forces, because it's in equilibrium, they're equal and opposite, okay? On all sides, if we take a large chunk of the earth out. Well, r remember the, the crust is pretty thin, right? But the lithosphere, part of the earth that's moving around, consists of the crust and also the sort of uppermost mantle. And that uppermost mantle is a viscoelastic material. And what are we, we talked about viscoelasticity earlier in the class in the sense that, remember, viscoelasticity or one manifestation of viscoelasticity is if I, if I apply a force to something and I hold it, and it continues to strain at the same force, right? That's called creep. We talked about that. Right? So this is sort of what goes on in the uppermost mantle, right? I, th there's forces that are in equilibrium due to uh, driving forces that play tectonics, and they're more or less constant, but the uppermost mantle strains, it creeps, right? And it causes a localized stress difference between the uppermost mantle and the crust, which is sitting right on top of it. And in order for the crust, which is stronger, not necessarily at that scale viscoelastic, more like a brittle material, okay, an elastic brittle material, then the only way for it to 
sort of remain in, in equilibrium such that there's a homogeneous deformation of the whole lithosphere is for it to fracture. Right? So, uh, trying to think of a good sort of analogy for, uh, kind of think like maybe like an apple pie or something. You know, <laughs> if you could hold a piece of apple pie in your hands and, and you squeezed it, obviously the, 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 what do you call the part underneath the crust? But the, the mantle of the apple pie would, you know, kind of easily continue to form and the, the crust would eventually fracture. Right? And so the whole, surface of the earth is sort of doing this at all times. And this is kind of the mechanism for it. Like skin on pudding. Skin on pudding. I'm not a big pudding eater, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't ate any pudding since elementary school, I guess. When, um, so anyway, uh, the the data corroborates this. So, I mean, what what I previously described and then showed you in that figure is sort of cartoonish, right, uh, uh, mechanism. But but the data more or less corroborates this. So, this is uh, basically data from uh, a principles, maximum, minimum principles, effective stress uh, data from a bunch of uh, ver quite deep wells, and you can see that for the most part. They, they line up on, you know, there's some air bounds associated with these measurements uh, that are kind of come from the, the cross lines. But for the most part, uh, you can see that they line up pretty well on this, you know, 0.6 line. And so uh, basically, you know, the, and this is one plot, but there's lots of data that more or less co corroborates this theory that the, the whole crust is in a, in, always in an incipient shear failure state, okay? And so then, if we believe that to be true, we can sort of use that and a little bit of theory to, to make some bounds on the stress values in the Earth. And the idea here is that if the whole Earth, the crust of the Earth, is distributed with little fractures, okay? And only some of those fractures, of course, will be in a, in a optimally oriented for slip, right? Obviously, if you, have a, if you have a stress, you know, S1 that's applied there, you know, any fracture that's perf perfectly perpendicular to it, it's not going to slip, okay? But some of, some of them will be optimally oriented to slip, and in this picture, those are, are um, indicated by the dark uh, black lines, the darker black lines. And those are indicated on the Moore circle uh, by this point one, associated with the shear and normal stress on those faults, okay? <clears throat> and so then there are, of course, a bunch of other ones uh, that are indicated by, say, two and three that aren't optimally or oriented for slip. So from this, you can see, and, and this, of course, this, uh, in this case, you know, keep in mind, this is, we're talking about friction, so we're talking about shear and normal stress on the fault. So even though we use the same diagram, this is not the more Coulomb material model that, that has to do with the internal friction of the material, right? In that case, you remember there were always some cohesion. There was always some cohesion, so the line was up here, right? So it's the same phenomen you know, phenomenological sort of model. But, but this, we're talking about friction on a, a fault, not, not part of the material model. So that's why, you know, on a fault, there's very little cohesion. Cohesion would be, on a fault, would be if I had a fault and I tried to apply a, a normal tensile stress, was there any resistance to pulling it apart? There might be a tiny bit if it's a cement, you know, if it's cemented over time, right? But compared to the, the, the other forces, it, it's tiny. So it's effectively zero, and that's why this line crosses through the zero point. So uh, using this model, we can come up with the optimal angle, beta, 
in the more circle diagram for um, fault slippage. And then if we use that, in addition to some observations from our Andersonian classification about the ordering of the principal stresses, then we can sort of make some or infer some observations about what should happen uh, in these faults. So if you have an Andersonian normal faulting regime, you'll get, according to this, you'll get those ones that, that are optimally oriented, you'll get faults that form in conjugate pairs that dip at 60 degrees and strike parallel to the direction of SH max. So in conjugate pairs, we mean like opposite. So you'll get, you'll get two faults, you know, and it always has to sort of be in pairs, otherwise it won't be in equilibrium, right? So you'll get two faults equal and opposite that occur at these 60 degree and then, you know, I won't insult you by reading all these observations because you can read, uh, but the other ones are there too, okay? And there's more discussion of this in the book. Of course, again, just to remind you guys, uh, we more or less, you know, anywhere that I'm, I'm uh, talking, the, the detail in the book is more or less associated with the material near, near these figures that I go through the effort to make sure in sight. So if you're ever curious about where we are in the book, just look at the figure numbers and then read the one or two pages around that. Okay. Um, so we can also, basically from the geometry of the Mohr circle, um, because the whole model is based on this Mohr circle idea, we, from the geometry of the Mohr circle, we can uh, come up with a, a sort of maximum ratio of the principal stresses, right? And so uh, for a friction coefficient of 0.6, we see that the maximum ratio of maximum to minimum principal stress on an optimally oriented fault is somewhere around 3.1, okay? So if we know that's true, or that's a model, okay, then, and I don't, I don't know why my, I have to figure out why my, these are fractions, why my fractions don't show up. So, um, so in, in that case, you and the Andersonian classification scheme, okay, so in the Andersonian classification scheme, we know what sigma 1 and sigma 3 are according to the Andersonian classification scheme. So in this case, if we're talking about normal faulting, strike-slip faulting, reverse faulting, then we can plug in, according to the Andersonian classification, the maximum and minimum principal stresses into our equations, okay? And this, in this case, for normal faulting, gives us a bound on SH min. So SV, we, SV we assume to be the overburden pressure, right? So we compute it to be the overburden pressure. The pore pressure in these cases, we assume to be hydrostatic. So basically, we know this evaluates to a number. The numerator evaluates to a number. We plug in a value for the friction coefficient, 0 0.6 in this case. And then the only unknown in this problem is SH min, right? <clears throat> and we, we can solve this inequality for SH min, and that gives us a bound on SH min. So this is the lower bound of SH min for normal faulting regime, right? And then we just apply the same procedure, okay? Strike-slip faulting is a little bit harder because in the strike-slip faulting regime, the principal stress you can easily compute as the vertical is the intermediate principal stress. So the min and max are SH min and SH max, and you don't, there's no easy way to compute those. You basically have to measure them or infer them somehow. We'll, we'll talk about how to do that later in the class, I mean, usually from hydraulic fracturing or leak off tests. You can infer SH min. And so in this case, what we do or what, what this plot shows is for 
a given value of SH min, a hydrostatic pore pressure, we can compute the dom denominator, and then this equation gives an upper bound on SH max, and that's what this line is, the upper bound of SH max. Okay, and then so for reverse vaulting scheme, you know that we know the denominator for the art, for the same reasons below uh, that we talked about over here. We can compute SV. We know we assume the hydrostatic pore pressure gradient, so we know that, and then we solve for SH max. And according to this equality, then we have a upper bound on it. Okay. And if you if you actually have some measurements of the pore pressure. Uh, like we talked about over, earlier, and you know that there's say sort of an overpressure state or whatever. Well, you can you can plug this in as well and get estimates for you know more accurate estimates for the bounds. 